AHLA is pleased to present this special series highlighting the top 10 health law issues of 2022, where we bring together thought leaders from across the health law field to discuss the major trends and developments of the year. Support for AHLA and this series is provided by PYA, which helps clients find value in the complex challenges related to mergers and acquisitions, clinical integrations, regulatory compliance, business valuations and fair market value assessments, and tax and assurance. For more information, visit PYAPC.com. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the 2022 AHLA Top 10 Issues in Health Law podcast series. This is Bob Paskowski, and I'm a, a consulting principal with PYA, and today we're going to be discussing one of those topics, frankly, one of my favorites around surprise billing and hospital price transparency. I would like to introduce Ben Fee from Hall Render, who co-authored the article back in December. And we're here to talk about these topics specifically through the lens of both patients and providers. Good morning, Ben. Uh, good morning. Hi, Bob. Thanks. Uh, thanks for, for being part of this conversation. Looking forward to our, our discussion today. Great. Well, let's break these two topics down and let's perhaps start with the, the more simpler one, which is the hospital price transparency topic first, which did take effect. That requirement took effect last January of 2021. So we've got a year runway on this, this, particular, uh, this particular topic. So Ben, how would you characterize year one as we look back at how did it come out from an enforcement perspective? How did the implementation come out? Yeah, it's a, it's a good place to start, and, and certainly it's probably the simpler one, uh, only because we we have had it in place for over a year now. Uh, if if we were recording this, uh, you know, 18 months ago, I don't think anybody would would describe the the hospital price transparency as a a simple uh, requirement, certainly to to try to comply with. Uh, so so as just a reminder, the the hospital price transparency we're really we're talking about the the rule that requires uh, licensed hospitals, most licensed hospitals within the United States, to uh, post prices for the items and services they provide on their uh, on their website in a couple of different ways, and you know most importantly uh, or most notably that includes payer specific negotiated rates, uh, which certainly was the most controversial probably aspect of that rule. Uh, as you mentioned, it's been in place since January 1st, uh, 2021, uh, so over a year now, and, and so now we're really looking at uh, what is the current implementation uh, status and, and what is the enforcement environment like. On, on implementation, it kind of depends on what resource certainly you're looking at. There have been some pretty high profile publications, Bob, as, as you know, and, and you've certainly seen. Uh, that have come out that, that show industry wide compliance at, at maybe somewhere around uh, 70 to 90 percent uh, compliance, meaning that there are uh, 10 to, to 30 percent of hospitals that have made no effort to comply, at least according to the to some of those uh, publications. Uh, there have also been some high profile uh, publications in in news outlets about hospital compliance rates. I think the most recent was from the Wall Street Journal, which was actually just published uh, here in the beginning of January 2022. So you can, again, uh, maybe take issue with some of the findings in those reports in terms of whether a hospital is actually compliant or not, but, but it's undeniable that there are, there are some hospitals within the United States that um, have not made uh, any attempt to post this information, uh, certainly. Uh, and then even when you look at the hospitals that have, if you're going to see a wide variety or variation in terms of where compliance is at in terms of uh, maybe you know, the, the gold standard best practices uh, versus hospitals that have just at least made some effort, but maybe it's still difficult to navigate their uh, publicly available information. And, you know, regardless of where you think industry compliance is at, it, it's undeniable too. I think that, that CMS and HHS are aware of those same reports uh, that I mentioned. And, and we see that reflected in the fact that the penalty for non-compliance has increased. Um, recently, it went from a, a fairly low um, penalty of, of a maximum $300 a day penalty just, right. uh, uh, per hospital uh, compared to other, uh, you know, non-compliance issues within healthcare, that's a very low penalty. So they, they've increased that recently to a, a per bed penalty of $10. And so for, for larger hospitals, uh, 
uh, although there's a cap on it, the penalty can actually go up to, uh, you know, $5,500 um, per day. So it's so a substantial increase over the $300 a day penalty. Um, you know, that's the penalties in terms of enforcement and auditing. We actually have not seen any publicly posted uh, financial penalties at this stage. Uh, a year later, what we do know is that audits uh, have certainly started and, and continue to, 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 to go on. Uh, the latest numbers I think I've seen CMS uh, quoted as, as providing is they've sent out somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 warning letters to hospitals about potential non-compliance with the price transparency requirements. Um, and maybe about 100 of those included a formal uh, corrective action plan by the hospital. So I think what we can expect or certainly expect in 2022 is that those audits are gonna continue, that CMS is probably gonna even ramp up uh, on the audit side. It's, it's actually a really, I, I view it as a very easy uh, regulation for CMS to audit on because they, they just have to go to a hospital's website. They don't have to come on site. Uh, they don't have to request medical records. It's a fairly uh, simple audit process for CMS. So I think we're going to see the audits continue, uh, even increase. And I think some sometime here in 2022, we're going to start seeing uh, CMS actually financially penalizing hospitals for noncompliance. Great. Thanks, Ben, for that, that summary of, of hospital price transparency. So now let's shift gears and talk a little about surprise billing. Um, lot to unpack here, <laughs> lots, lots of pieces to this. So I want to start really with the No Surprises Act. Um, if I use NSA, that, that, that's the acronym for that. And some of those provisions did take effect actually just a few days ago, uh, January 1st of 2022. But as we try to compartmentalize all of those different provisions, you know, how, how is the best way to do that? Um, I, I think of it certainly through you know, what providers are affected, uh, which services are, are affected, and what things are required as of January 1 of 2022 um, that should already be implemented. So maybe if you could compartmentalize it through those kind of those different lenses, that would be helpful for the audience. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're right. The No Surprises Act, uh, there is a lot to unpack in that legislation. And it really does help, at least for me, when I'm working through these issues, when I'm uh, talking to organizations about this, um, Bob, you and I discussed this uh, quite a bit in preparation for recording today. Um, it, it helps me to start with categorizing it first uh, and, and kind of breaking up the No Surprises Act into really what I view as two different rules uh, or laws. The, the first is the the surprise billing protections, the balanced billing protections for patients. And that was really uh, kind of what we think about when we think about No Surprises Act and, and what, what we think Congress's, I think, focus really was and on this issue that had, had uh, we've been looking for a federal solution for a few years now is on those surprise billing protections. And so that's kind of the uh, bucket number one. And then in bucket number two um, is really, I think, another uh, price transparency uh, rule that, that has little to do with surprise billing, uh, and that's this requirement to provide a good faith estimate of expected charges, uh, which, which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. But I think it's, it's helpful to start by kind of breaking it up into those two larger categories, because when we think about, as you said, who it applies to, when it applies, what services does it applies to, it's really going to depend on whether we're talking about surprise billing protections or whether we're talking about the, the requirement to provide a good faith estimate. Um, the, and, and before we can kind of talk about, you know, which one applies in which uh, situation, but, but you're right, uh, some of it was effective January 1st of 2022, so uh, it's effective now, and, and so if you're just at a high level, uh, I think, think about the, the areas that are effective now, so which are probably most important to, to everybody listening to this, um, you start with knowing that those, those patient balance billing protections uh, those are in place. Those are in place as of January 1st, and those, those are fully effective at this point. Uh, the second is, again, the, the price transparency part of this, the requirement to provide a good faith estimate. Uh, those are in place right now as well, at least to the extent that you're required to provide a good faith estimate to uh, individuals who are uninsured or self-pay. Um, and then the third area that's uh, 
in place as of January 1st is there's certain uh, patient notification uh, requirements and and that includes providing uh, patients notification of their uh, protections under the surprise billing uh, law uh, and then the right to receive or request a good faith estimate and, and that includes things like uh, providing it uh, to the patient directly and, and also posting that information to uh, the, the facility or organization's website and then uh, also posting it in certain locations within a, a patient care setting. So, so from um, what's in place right now, it's those three things. The patient uh, balance billing protections are in place. Uh, the requirement to provide a good faith estimate to uninsured individuals is in place. And then the certain post, uh, patient notification rights uh, are also in place. So uh, certainly if an organization is, is starting now to think about what they need to do, uh, start with those three areas. Um, uh, and then you mentioned, you know, how do we then kind of break this down to what what types of organizations does it apply to? When does it apply? Um, I think it's helpful to, to again, talk about the surprise balance or balance billing protections, and then talk about the good faith estimate requirement, uh, and, and kind of seeing which applies in what circumstances. And uh, I start with the balance billing protections, uh, which really provide, um, provide those protections in a couple different situations. And that's when uh, an individual receives emergency services from an out of network uh, provider. Um, and that really applies in the, the uh, facility setting and including hospitals most notably. So uh, anytime an individual receives emergency services from an out of network facility, these protections apply. They also apply to non-emergency services when those services are provided by an out of network provider at an in-network facility. Uh, so slightly different circumstances when those apply in that setting. Uh, and then air ambulance services um, uh, as well. So when we kind of discuss that, you think about uh, what types of providers were really in the surprise billing protections. Again, it's, it's both provider, individual providers and facilities, uh, but whether it applies kind of depends on the services being received and, and where they're being received. Um, and then finally, from a patient's perspective, it's these are protections uh, kind of by definition for individuals who have health insurance coverage uh, through usually a non-governmental payer. So really anybody covered under um, employer sponsored or self-insured health plan uh, or other health insurance product, uh, these protections will be or are in place. And, it, and so then when you think about the good faith estimate requirement, uh, this is the requirement to provide a, a good faith estimate of expected charges for uh, scheduled items or services. And so right away you see there's a difference because the good faith estimate requirement uh, applies just to scheduled services, which makes sense. You're not gonna be able to provide a good faith estimate in advance uh, of an emergency service. Uh, second, it, it's much broader in its application as to, to practice locations or, or types of providers that it applies to. It actually applies not only to the hospital facility setting, but really to almost any uh, patient care location or provider, uh, including independent or, or freestanding physician practice locations. Uh, those locations also, based on the way that, that uh, the departments have defined certain terms, are required to provide these good faith estimates. Um, the other difference though, certainly in surprise billing and good faith estimate requirement is from the patient's perspective, as you mentioned. Uh, for now, uh, the requirement to provide a good faith estimate only applies to uninsured patients or, or self-pay patients. And so uh, a completely different population uh, of patients than, than the surprise billing protections apply to. So, you know, just from a high level, I think, again, you, you kind of have to decide which, which of these two areas are you talking about? And then you can start to break down when does it apply? Where does it apply? What patients does it apply to? Right, and for the, the people listening to this, um, this podcast, as well as, you know, as we consult with our clients, it's just good to kind of sketch that out, right? I mean, all those different pieces uh, and depends on where you're at, um, what kind of facility you are, um, if you're in or out of network, what kind of patient is, really to kind of have a good visual of okay, these are the pieces I need to really start to put into place here, you know, immediately. Yeah, 
absolutely. I don't. Um, I I always have those types of resources uh, in front of me when I talk about these. I've got I've got a lot of those resources in front of me right now uh, as we're talking. Uh, and anytime I work through one of these issues, um, I'm going to start by just sketching it out and, and kind of breaking it down and thinking, okay, what specifically are we talking about? Which area are we even in? Uh, to just again, the No Surprises Act is such a broad piece of legislation, and, and it's going through the rulemaking process. And so it can be kind of overwhelming if you just start with the question of, uh, tell me what do we need to do to comply with the No Surprises Act? That's a difficult one to answer uh, succinctly, certainly. Right, and, and we talked a little bit too about where we've got at least clients, uh, prospects that are all over the, the, the space right now as far as where do I stand with this? Some, you know, as late as last year that started having questions about this as well as more advanced uh, notice. So I guess also just want to maybe get a feel from you on where do we think the providers specifically are on this topic uh, from a readiness perspective? Um, certainly I would think that the government sort of like price transparency will kind of catch up to the enforcement piece of this. But again, I think everybody's still kind of, you know, maneuvering these new waters, so to speak. Um, so just curious where you think a lot of, um, you know, your clients or other providers are in, in, as far as the readiness piece. Yeah, just, just like um, you've experienced, uh, I, I think we, we see different, uh, different levels of readiness, if you will, kind of uh, across the spectrum, uh, certainly from organizations that uh, upon the passage of the No Surprises Act back in the, at the end of 2020, uh, already started to think about uh, what would be required in terms of compliance. Certainly at that point, it was, it was hard to, I think, uh, imagine, certainly I didn't expect at least, uh, the level of, of uh, time and effort it was going to take uh, based on how the rulemaking has, has played out. But we had clients that were thinking about it uh, very early in 2021 and start, starting to get ready. And, and certainly I, I know that there are organizations out there that are um, probably now just starting to think about what they need to do. And it, it's very understandable. It's been a very compressed timeline uh, for rulemaking, especially given uh, just how substantial of an impact this has on uh, provider operations in, in some ways. And, and, and then of course, uh, hospitals and providers are, are continuing to respond to the, the ongoing public health emergency. So uh, resources and attentions have been focused elsewhere. So it's really a, across a, a spectrum in terms of readiness. And, and at this point though, certainly I would, I would recommend anybody who has not started to think about it or put, it, uh, put uh, policies or, or procedures in place that they need to, to, to begin immediately. Right. Thanks, Ben. So, so now that we've kind of started with this imp implementation of certain provisions, there's still a lot of uncertainties when it comes to the, the NSA. And there are still a lot of provisions that will be have future rulemaking on them throughout this year. But so I'm going to ask you, Ben, a little bit to you know get out your crystal ball hmm. and, and kind of think of what should we expect from the industry this year um, as far as you know more, more of these provisions kind of rolling out and what impact that may have um, in 2022. Yeah, absolutely. You know, despite the fact that. As we discussed, there, there's a lot of this that's that's effective now. Um, there is still quite a bit uh, of changes to come, I think, and, and we can expect uh, some substantial either revisions or additional rulemaking uh, in 2022. We're, we're by no means uh, do we know right now uh, how all of these rules are, are ultimately going to be finalized. I mean, maybe starting with the easiest one, um, I mentioned that the requirement to provide the good faith estimate uh, applies to uninsured or self-pay patients right now, but the, the legislation itself actually requires a good faith estimate to be provided for patients who have insurance as well. Uh, the process is a little bit different with that good faith estimate actually going to the, the insurance or, or plan that, that covers the individual rather than to the individual directly. Um, but that's currently not, uh, HHS is technically using enforcement discretion on that piece. And so uh, there's not an obligation to comply with that uh, right now. And, and HHS has said that they're going to use that enforcement discretion pending additional rulemaking. 
So we certainly can expect to see a rule on the requirement to provide a good faith estimate to individuals with insurance uh, sometime in 2022. I think I've heard um, some, some are estimating that that might come in about uh, June or July of 2022. It could be later, but sometime in 2022, we should expect to see that rule. So we know that's coming. Um, and the other thing that is, I think, important to keep in mind with all this is the, the two significant rulemaking um, that we've seen so far were both were both published as interim final rules with, with requests for comments. So that's not the typical full notice and comment rulemaking that, that many of us are used to. And there were some reasons that, that HHS and the other departments felt it was necessary to, to use this process uh, in this situation. But what I think that means is that even though these rules are final and they're effective, they did solicit comments and they have received thousands of comments from the industry um, on the two rules that they published, one in July and one in October. And so I, I think we should reasonably expect that there will be some modifications to that final rule in response to the comments. I do, I do think the departments uh, are going to, certainly they're going to review the comments and, and I do think that they will actually uh, revise their final rules in response to those comments. Um, you know, the, the comment period for the second rule just closed here in, in December uh, 2021. So uh, it could be a few months before we see anything uh, in terms of revisions. But again, I'd expect some some changes uh, in 2022, even to the rules that we do have. Um, and then in the final piece is not from the rulemaking perspective, but the other area where we're, we're going to keep an eye on is there there is at least one legal challenge brought by the American Hospital Association, American Medical Association, and, and a few others uh, challenging a fairly narrow uh, but important aspect of the rulemaking process that, that really is focused on um, the independent dispute resolution process and, the, and the, that, that works to figure out what a payer has to pay to an out-of-network uh, provider. And the, the rules without getting into all the details, created a presumption in, in favor of what we call the qualifying payment amount. And I think there has been uh, substantial, almost universal uh, response from the industry objecting to that approach. And, and we've seen that now in, in a legal challenge. And so we will see uh, over the next few months, again, uh, how that legal challenge progresses and, and whether that um, causes the agent or the departments to have to modify the rules. Uh, so that's certainly another thing that we're going to keep our eyes on over the next uh, few months and, and could have a fairly substantial impact uh, on some of this. Yeah, I, I found it interesting too that how the industry is starting to react already to some of this that that is just literally taking effect now. And as these, these kind of um, topics roll out, um, businesses are, are reacting to it. Um, so it, it'd just be interesting to kind of watch how, you know, the reaction of, as these future rules come out, um, how much resistance we'll get from some of the associations you've mentioned, um, as this all kind of settles down when the final act is all, you know, fully implemented. So just curious, what, what do you think there that do we expect more interference from, you know, industry, from certain associations as this? again, some more of these rules start to take effect. Yeah, I mean, it's an evolving area. When we talk about price transparency and when we talk about surprise billing protections, and, and certainly when we talk about price transparency, I just focused on kind of the hospital side today, but of course there's there's uh, corresponding obligations that are, that are coming into effect on the plan side uh, in certain other areas where the federal government has really increased their efforts to, to make prices transparent to the public. And, and we're going to, I, I think we can always expect that there's going to be some, there's going to be challenges and pushback from the industry uh, on some of these, but um, certainly over the last couple of years, it seems like there is bipartisan support uh, in, in DC for, for many of these efforts. And so far the federal government actions have survived legal challenges. And so, we're, we're going to continue to see industry pushback and, and, and certainly some of the industry is embracing some of this as well. Um, but you're right. I mean, it, it could look quite a bit different here uh, in two or three years in terms of just what the, the rules require of, of everybody. 
uh, including on the provider side and certainly on the plan side as well, um, what, what implementation looks like and then what impact that has on, on, on the industry in terms of uh, business strategy and financial decisions that organizations are making um, as more of this information becomes available. Yeah, I have a feeling that we may be having this series, uh, those topic in future series, maybe next year and next the following year too, Ben. So again, just Ben, I appreciate your time today, giving some really good insight into you know, hospital price transparency and surprise billing. Uh, this is, um, again, a very interesting topic to, to discuss this afternoon. And, and to our audience, uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of the podcast series. Thank you. Thank you.